Hello and welcome back. In this lecture, I'll go through a few more mathematical examples of categories. The first example is arguably the most important category, the category of sets, which I'll refer to as just set. First, what is an object of the category of sets? Unsurprisingly, an object of set is just a set, i.e. a collection of things. Next, what's a map between two sets? I'll define a map f from x to y to be the data of a function from x to y. In other words, an assignment for every element of x, a unique element of y. Finally, what's the composition procedure? In this category, composition is just composition of functions. It's important when you're first starting out to learn how to rephrase stuff you might know from set theory in terms of a more categorical language. For example, an element of a set is the data of a map from a set with a single element to x. Whenever I have an element of x, I can construct a function which sends the unique point to that element. Similarly, given a function, I can evaluate the function at the unique point and obtain an element of x. In other words, there is a bijection of sets between the set x and maps of set from a set with a single element into x. Next, let's say I have a map from x to y and an element of x, i.e. a map from a point to x. As these two maps are compatible, I can compose them. This gives me a point in y conventionally referred to as f of x or f evaluated at x. More generally, I can think of a subset A of x as a map by including A into x. I can then compose this map with f, obtaining the restriction of f to A. A common property of a function is to say it's constant. More specifically, a function is constant if it sends every element of x to a single fixed element of y. We can phrase this categorically as follows. An element of y is just a map from a point into y. f being constant means there exists a factorization of f through a point. Whereas classical logic based on a, I don't know, linear language would model constancy as a uniqueness property, this categorical articulation imagines constancy as first collapsing x to a point followed by picking out an element of y. Now let's talk about matrices. I'll encode matrices and structures thereon through a category called mat. What are the objects of this category? Well, an object will just be a whole non-negative number. Given two whole non-negative numbers, i.e. two objects of mat, what is the data of a map from n to m? I'll define this to be an n by m array of numbers a, i, j. Now for the interesting part, the composition procedure. Let's say I have two compatible maps a and b. Their composition needs to be an n by p array of numbers. Note that I just need to tell you their i kth entry, which is a, i, j, b, j, k. Here I'm using Einstein notation, so I really mean sum over all repeated indices, i.e. sum over j. In other words, composition in this category is just matrix multiplication. The compatibility condition in a category simply reflects the fact that I cannot necessarily multiply two arbitrary matrices. Next, you need to construct an identity, which turns out to be zeros everywhere except along the diagonal where it's equal to 1. This is usually written as the Dirac delta function. One can check that this is associative, which ultimately boils down to the associativity of ordinary multiplication and the commutativity of addition. The standard curriculum introduces this category to solve systems of linear equations of the form ax equals y0, where we think of a and y0 as given. This is just a shorthand way of writing m linear equations in n unknowns. Here, y0 is a column's worth of numbers, in other words, a map from 1 to m. What is a? a is a map from n to m, as it's just a bunch of numbers giving the coefficients of these equations. Unraveling a bit of formalism should convince you that a solution to this equation is the data of a factorization of y0 through a. Here, we see that solutions to systems of linear equations are stored as compositions in this category. Next, I'd like to note something immediate from the definition, which is that maps in this category from 1 to 1 are just numbers. I mean, a 1 by 1 array of numbers is just a number. I'll leave it as an exercise to show the following. Given a column vector x, I can consider x transpose, which is a row vector or a map from n to 1. As they are compatible, I can consider their composition, which is a map from 1 to 1, i.e. a number, which turns out to be the norm of x. 
Next, I'd like to discuss another perspective coming from linear algebra, which I'll refer to as, I don't know, a linear algebra fact. First, if you know this, recall there exists a notion called a finite dimensional vector space. If one is familiar with this notion, one shouldn't have any trouble packaging this into a category of finite dimensional vector spaces and linear maps, which some people sometimes call vect. This has a classical relationship with matrices. First, I can associate a vector space to any object of mat, i.e. a whole non-negative number n, rn. Similarly, I can associate a whole non-negative number to any vector space v, namely its dimension. Next, I can extend every array of numbers to a linear map via linear extension on a basis. More advanced courses in linear algebra might convince you that these are two perspectives on the same thing. One of the benefits of categories is that there is a precise sense in which these two categories are, quote, equivalent. Why is this at all interesting? Well, whereas computers can understand matrices, nature presents us with vector spaces. For example, I don't know, like quantum systems. For example, a description of a one-dimensional vector space in terms of a number requires, in particular, a choice of units. But nature does not give us units. So now I'd like to talk about more geometric slash calculus things. I'll do so by defining a category of pointed Euclidean spaces, which I'll refer to as pointed Euclidean spaces or Euc sub point. An object of this category will consist of two pieces of data, a whole number n along with a point x in Rn. For example, you live in a place where n is equal to 3 or maybe 4, whatever, and your center of mass is a point in R3 or your center of mass at a particular point in time is a point in R4. Next, I need to tell you what a map is in this category. A map from n, x to m, y is defined to be the data of a smooth map, f, from Rn to Rm, satisfying the property that it sends x to y. For example, when n is equal to 1 and m is equal to 3, this is a path in three dimensions. x can be thought of as a point in time, and the condition is asking that the trajectory pass through a certain point at a certain time. Maps in the ordinary sense of the word correspond to the case when n is equal to m is equal to 2. And you should think that x and y are kind of like designated centers, and the property that the map sends x to y is something akin to asking that the map be centered. Composition is what you would imagine, just the composition of functions. However, I have this extra condition I need to make sure the composition procedure respects. I'd like to give an unnecessarily involved argument for why this composition procedure works. Namely, I'd like to show diagrammatically that the associativity of composition in the category of set gives that the composition we've defined respects the condition we've asked for. So let's say we have a compatible pair of maps f and g. I'll draw somewhat abusively the point x as the following map. I can compose the first two maps and obtain f of x, which, by assumption, equals y. I can further compose this map to attain g of y, which, by our assumption, equals z. Alternatively, I could compose the middle and right map to obtain f composed with g. I can further compose this map to obtain f composed with g evaluated at x. Note that this diagram is the associativity diagram introduced in the same lecture, and so the top map coincides with the bottom map. Therefore, the data I've written down forms a category. Differential calculus suggests that there is a relationship between Euclidean spaces and matrices. In other words, the derivative should give some sort of correspondence between the category of pointed Euclidean spaces and this category of matrices. This correspondence should take an object n, x and spit out n. It should take a smooth map f to its derivative evaluated at the point x. Since f has multiple inputs and outputs, the derivative will be an n by m matrix. Its ijth entry will be the partial derivative of the ith component of f in the jth direction evaluated at x. How should it behave on a composition? Well, it should take a composition f composed with g equals h to a composition in matrices df composed with dg equals dh. The fact that the derivative of a composition is a composition of matrices is a very non-trivial fact and goes under the heading of the chain rule. In other words, one way of thinking about the derivative is that it's an association between these two categories. Moreover, the chain rule reflects the fact that this construction is compatible with their higher dimensional structure. Note that this compatibility is essential for computing derivatives. 
Finally, note that the derivative sends the identity map of an n-dimensional Euclidean space to the identity matrix. This is because partial xi, partial xj evaluated at any point x is delta ij. So category theory is like swarming with cryptic aphorisms, commonly referred to as slogans. I'll end with one of the more famous aphorisms, which I'll put in scare quotes because it will involve a word I have yet to define. Namely, the chain rule expresses the functoriality of the derivative. In the coming lectures, I'll say what it means for an association between the objects and maps of two categories to be, quote, functorial. Briefly, an association of objects and maps in one category to object and maps in another forms a, quote, functor when two conditions are satisfied. It sends compositions to compositions and identities to identities. I'll go into detail the specifics of functors in coming lectures. And uh, that's all I have to say for now. Bye-bye.